Welcome to another episode of the EvokeCast. Today, I'm going to be talking about the concepts of internal and external training load. We recently released a, a two-part Instagram post where I described these concepts, um, but maybe it was because the videos were too short to get the ideas across, or maybe I just did a poor job of explaining the subject. Either way, we got some questions and requests for more on this topic, so I'm taking this longer format to make those ideas more explicit and helpful to athletes and coaches. So first I wanna restate the definitions of those terms um, that are central to this topic we're gonna be discussing today. Um, so the external training load is that the work that you do in your training sessions. In other words, that's the workouts, that's the stuff that you or your coach put in your training plan. And then there's the internal training load which is the effect that those external training loads have on your body. The internal load will also be a product of other stressors in your life, but for ease of discussion today, we're just gonna focus on the stress of training. I understand that these terms may not be familiar with you, but I hope you can connect some crucial dots once you listen to what I have to say, what's following here. Um, you may even recognize that I've spilled copious amounts of ink on this subject of controlling and monitoring what I've called in the past the training load in the books, training for the new optimism and training for the uphill athlete. You should probably, you've also probably heard this stuff discussed from several different angles on any number of our podcasts or in the articles on the Evoke website. Hopefully the use of these terms will help you understand that there is more to training than just doing the workout. So I'm basing this on my experience, which covers decades in the trenches, working with athletes every day of every ability from complete beginners to kids to Olympians. I've come to learn via mistakes that I made early on, and I continue to see other people making today that that second term, the internal load, is the more important of the two terms we're gonna be talking about. So I aim to make my case for monitoring and controlling the internal load so you don't have to make those same mistakes. So first, let's talk about the external load. Perhaps you're being coached or you're self-coached, or maybe you're just following a training plan. In all three cases, you will use prescribed training, usually given to you in a calendar format, although it might be on a spreadsheet. What matters is that there is some work that has to be done, that's the training and that's the external load. And you don't need to be an exercise scientist to understand that the work you do influences the processes of adaptation that your body makes. That's called the training effect. And it is through training that we make the adapt those adaptations that improve our physical performance by repeatedly exposing ourselves to that external training load. Well, at, at least that's the theory. Your plan calls for a particular workout and you execute it. It sounds so simple. What could possibly be wrong with that? Well, a lot, actually. Um, just because you can write down some training session that you plan for next Thursday does not mean that it is appropriate. I've often said in the past, any fool can write a training plan, and sadly, many do. But the real trick is the successful administration of a plan. So even a bad plan that's well-administered will be far better than the, the best plan ever written that's poorly administered. And really surprises me that the number of people that are only concerning themselves with the plan, the external load, as if we were all some sort of identical robots with identical responses to the same internal load, or excuse me, the same external load. If only it were that simple. I, we're actually extremely complex organisms with unique internal responses to the same external load. This uniqueness is the result of factors like age, sex, genetics, your fatigue state, your training history, and even the less tangible area of psychology. But the single most important thing every training plan must consider is the individual athlete. Ideally, the athlete should not have to adjust to fit the training. The training should adjust to fit the athlete. So now let's shift gears and talk a bit about the internal training load. So as I mentioned on Instagram, this is actually what should matter most to athletes and coaches, 
After all, you're training to affect changes in your body that in the end will you'll want to result in improved performance. And so you need to know what those changes, what's happening internally. But unfortunately, the internal load gets a lot less attention because monitoring it is actually pretty hard. It requires paying much more attention than just simply writing out the training plan. So the best way to control the internal training load is by controlling the intensity of the training. That's because training at different intensities causes different responses and adaptations. This is a well-established physiological fact. For intensity control, some programs suggest using the feeling the athlete has during training. I've seen things like a, a rating scale, which is often called RPE, the rated, rating of perceived exertion, that has a scale that runs from one through 10. That's the most common scale. Other programs use descriptors like easy, medium, or hard to prescribe intensity. The problem with both those kinds of subjective scales is that they rely on just what I said, the athlete's subjective feeling. And one person's easy is not gonna be another person's easy, as I will get to an example here shortly. Um, and as a consequence, these scales are open to a lot of interpretation. I mean, how hard is hard and how easy is easy? Often when we work with athletes who have been using such scales, we, we find that they, they know really what hard feels like. Almost all of us know what hard feels like but they don't know what easy feels like and they rarely train easy enough. You know, in our experience, using these subjective scales really not only works for athletes with a tremendous amount of experience training using a more concrete intensity scale that I'm about to discuss. For that reason, we strongly recommend setting up a heart rate zone system that is anchored on two important and unique to you metabolic events the so-called aerobic and anaerobic thresholds. This is done by using a couple of very simple tests um, and they're free. These tests allow you to individualize your zone system to your own personal response to, the, to exercising at different intensities. We feel this is so important that it's the very first step we undertake with any athlete we coach. Without this, you can't know what the external load is, let alone the internal load. Now, for a deep dive into heart rate zone systems, I'm putting a link in the show notes below about um, to an article uh, and a podcast about that. So while, while heart rate is actually only being a, a proxy for intensity and internal load, it's the most practical. It is also pro pro the only one that really provides reasonably good real-time feedback. Um, and it's far easier for the coach and or the training plan to convey the intended intensity than just using some subjective term. However, that proxy relationship of heart rate to internal load can break down in some important ways. If you determined your zones based on running tests conducted on flat ground, there's a good chance that those same heart rate zones will not be reflective of your response to things like cycling or hiking steeply uphill, especially if you're hiking steeply uphill carrying a heavy pack. That's why we recommend conducting your aerobic and anaerobic threshold tests in the same modalities that you'll be using in your training and then adjusting the zones accordingly. That what I mean by that is, you know, if you're going to be doing a, an easy run on gentle terrain, then yeah, that running treadmill test you might have done to determine your aerobic or anaerobic threshold, that's perfectly suitable. If on the other hand, you're going to be carrying, a, you know, let's say 30 or 40 percent of your body weight steeply uphill in a heavy pack, there's a very slim chance that your flat running thresholds are going to be the same as, as they were. So you need to test in both those uh, modalities. So by controlling the intensity of the external load using heart rate, you've taken the most important step toward controlling the internal load. There's very good reasons why heart rate-based intensity training has been the go-to method for endurance athletes since the early 80s. It's the best real-time method, honestly. Well, it has been replaced by power meters in cycling, and running power meters are beginning to rival heart rate as a way of controlling intensity. For most of us, heart rate will remain our default method. But when it comes to actually monitoring, monitoring now, not controlling, but monitoring the internal training load, remember, that's the effect of the workout you're doing. Then we have to look for some other method. 
So, and outside the lab, which isn't very practical for most of us, certainly not on a regular basis, the most accurate way of monitoring the internal training load is by checking the athlete's blood lactate concentration during training. The blood lactate concentration gives a window into the metabolic processes that are fueling the exercise. Whereas we use heart rate as a proxy for the internal load, lactate levels are not a proxy. They are an actual measure of the internal load. The disadvantages of using lactate measurement are mainly the cost, a few hundred dollars, the learning curve, so it's just going to take you a while to figure out how to do this, and, the, and a hassle factor. So it's just a little bit more impractical. We do have an in-depth discussion on the use of lactate meters on our website, and that will also be linked to below in the show notes. But to illustrate the importance of monitoring the internal training load using lactate, I want to give an example from my own coaching from many years ago. This is before I was using the aerobic and anaerobic thresh threshold tests that we currently recommend. Back then, the most common system for setting zones was to use a percentage of the athlete's maximum heart rate. One of the reasons I've railed against zone systems based on those percentages is that they lack individualization to the athlete. This particular example I'm about to explain was when the blinders came off for me. I was coaching some top U.S. cross-country skiers. And back then, I often was with the athletes for almost every training session. And I coached these two guys whose race results were very close. You know, both of them were classic mesomorphs. That meaning they were lean and muscular. Um, They're both about six feet tall, 190 pounds with about 5% body fat. So, and they had nearly identical maximum heart rates. And as a consequence, I'd prescribed nearly identical training intensity zones. One day I was driving alongside them as I often did when I, when it was, this was like a, an easy, a long, easy, supposedly easy roller ski. So they're on, on pavement on roller skis and I'm driving along often carrying like some extra water or food and that sort of thing. And over the previous couple of weeks, I'd noticed that one of them was beginning to show signs of overtraining. So just on a whim, I decided to stop them and I checked their blood lactate levels. Why I decided to do that just then, I can't say, but it was really providential. Both their heart rates were in what should have been zone one or low zone two, just like we had expected. And both of them thought the pace felt pretty easy. <clears throat> but you can imagine my surprise and honestly my concern when one of them had a lactate concentration of 1.7 millimoles per liter, which was right what I expected and wanted for this kind of zone one to low zone two type training. <clears throat> But the other skier, the one who had the signs of overtraining, had a reading of 3.7, which placed him in the upper end of zone three. That was absolutely not the intended, uh, the turn, excuse me, the internal training load that I had intended for this workout. That type of intensity would be or is unsustainable on a daily basis. And it told me why he was flirting with overtraining. So right then and there, a big light bulb flashed on for me. And that the main takeaway took, immediately took away was setting intensity training zones based on a percentage of maximum, or even some people used a different type of percentages um, to set these zones was foolish and potentially dangerous. And this was true despite the prevailing wisdom of the day. So in this case, identical external training loads were being applied to athletes that on paper should have seen very similar internal loads, but they were seeing strikingly different internal loads. What was a nice, easy zone one, two to two session for one skier that he would easily recover from by the next day was far too intense for the other skier. I would never have known this vital piece of feedback had it not been for my checking the lactates. And as a, a quick side note, it was only later that I figured out the second skier had was predominantly a fast switch athlete, um, the guy with the higher lactate readings. And that was quite common. And it opened my eyes um, to certain things that explained you know, why they were seeing a different internal response to the training. And it was what began my interest in 
kind of understanding and helping people understand the need for different training methods for fast and slow twitch athletes. There's also another article that I've linked to below that talks about that. Um, so now we're going to summarize here, but does this stuff really matter to your training? Well, my opinion, it matters very much to every endurance athlete. I don't care if you're a pro or you're just getting started. Now, you don't need to spend $300 on a lactate meter. You can just establish the training zone system for free using the methods that I've, we've outlined in detail on the site. But if you're not doing that, then you're doing what I was doing back in the day and you're flying blind. So don't make the same mistake I did. Thanks for joining in and I'll look for you next week.